Good morning, church family. My name is Garrett McCord, and I am the interim minister to students and their families here at FBC. I hope everybody's having a good morning. It is cold. Um, let me tell you, enjoy our obligatory three days of winter while it lasts. Um, at least our water's running this time, right? Praise the Lord. Um, yeah, amen. And so if you have your Bible, go ahead and flip open to John chapter 14. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 6 this morning. And if you don't have a Bible, there should be one in the pew rack in front of you, and that is our gift to you. You can take that. That is yours to write in, highlight, mark up. We want you to have a copy of the Word of God. And so if you've been with us these past few weeks, we've been in our I Am series. And so we've been looking through the book of John at the seven key I Am statements that Jesus shared. And these have been some amazing statements such as, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. And so in each of these statements, we've seen God reveal a little bit more about his character. And in doing that, we get to see how Jesus offers himself to us today in our own lives. And so this morning, we're going to be looking at the second to last I am statement. And it's really almost like the climactic I am statement of the book of John, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So if you pray with me real quick, we're going to get started. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity we have here this morning to get to read from your word, to get to just see a little bit more of who you are. I pray that, Holy Spirit, you would do what only you can do this morning, that you would change us that you would transform our hearts, that you would conform us to the image of your son, and that we would leave here looking a little bit more like you, Jesus, that, that we would have open ears and hearts and eyes to your truth this morning. Father, we love you, we praise you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. So happy new year, everybody. Um, and it was funny, as I was preparing to preach this morning, I actually realized when I was looking back over my notes that I preached New Year's last year on contentment. And so it was really kind of this cool exercise to look back over the past year and think about all of the things that have happened. And it's been a great year, don't get me wrong. For my family personally, um, we were able to buy land here in Bernie. We're, my wife and I are actually expecting our first child. And so it has been a fantastic year. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate that, but even though it's been a great year, if I'm being honest, as I look back over this year, I, I think that it's in some way, shape, or form been defined by stress and anxiety, if, if we can be honest with each other this morning, right? I mean, COVID is always around the corner. Um, there's, there's constant upheaval. Are we gonna shut down? Are we not gonna shut down? Um, and, then, and then you have this rise in cost of living, right? You have constant political unrest, there's this constant anxiety and worry about the direction of our culture. And, and it's just so easy to find things to be stressed about. I mean, I made a joke about it earlier, but you realize that freeze that knocked out the power grid, that was this year, right? It feels like it was like 10 years ago. That was just a couple of months ago. That's how crazy this year has been. But the thing is, it's not just this year. We always fall into this trap around New Year's that we think, man, this past year has been totally crazy. If we can just get through it, then everything is gonna be fine. But the reality is, guys, it's, it's more than just a year or two of craziness. It's a trend. Our society has been defined by stress and anxiety for a long time. And so as I was studying this and looking into it, I found some statistics that talk about this. And so just read these with me real quick. In 2018, a poll in the UK showed that in the past year, 74% of people have felt so stressed that they've been overwhelmed or unable to cope. And if that's just United Kingdom, in America, nearly two in three adults say that the current amount of uncertainty in our nation causes them stress. And three in five say that the number of issues America faces is currently overwhelming to them. So if you look to your left and your right, statistics show that two of you came in here stressed this morning. <laughs> and, and the sad thing is the stress and the anxiety that we've experienced as a, as a nation and really as a, just people has impacted decision making. Because if you look into the American birth rate, that's the amount of new babies being born each year, and it's the lowest rate that it's ever been. And other countries are experiencing a similar dip from anywhere from about four to 10%. And so many people draw or tie this back to the fact that would-be parents, couples, are anxious to bring a child into the world because they're anxious about the direction that the world is going. And I think the most devastating statistic of them all is that among individuals reporting a lifetime history of suicide attempts, over 70% say they suffer from anxiety. 
And I could keep rattling off statistics about why things look pretty dire right now, but I don't think I need to to get that point across to you this morning, right? Most of us walked in here dealing with something, whether it's uncertainty about the new year, things to come, whether it's an illness in the family, a financial situation, parents talking about kid, being afraid to bring kids into the world. If you do have children, you're afraid about what the school system's teaching them. You're afraid about the world that they're growing up in, and it can feel overwhelming. And I think we all know that we're in desperate need of some good news. And praise God, that good news is exactly what we have for you this morning. Right, not me, nothing I bring to the table, but what scripture has for you this morning. Because in John 14, Jesus provides the answer to all of the stress, all of the anxiety, all of the worry that we can conjure up himself. And it, because if you think about world rattling stress and anxiety, that's exactly the context that we're gonna step into in John 14. So let me kind of paint the image for you and where we're jumping into in the New Testament. Imagine the scene, right? The disciples have been living on the road with Jesus for three years. And this isn't just like kind of on and off, like we hang out with him for a few weeks and then we see him again later. No, this is literally every day, every moment of every day, right? And so everything is caught up with Jesus, right? They've spent every single moment together, laughter, meals, tears, fears. And not only that, but they've seen amazing things. They've seen Miracle after miracle, the sick healed, the dead raised, and ultimately, many of them in some way, shape, or form and on different levels have come to the conclusion that this Jesus is the promised Messiah. And then, to make things even crazier, shortly before Passover, they're coming into Jerusalem, right? And and this is a big deal, because Jesus has been avoiding Jerusalem for a while. And they come into Jerusalem, and what happens is what we call the triumphant entry. So they're walking in, Jesus is sitting on a colt, and there's people lining the streets, praising him, saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, the king has come. And these disciples in their minds are looking forward, and they're like, man, this is it. This is what we've been waiting for from the Messiah. Because they thought that the Messiah was gonna overthrow the Romans and create this new kingdom for the Jewish people. The problem is a week passes and none of that's happened quite yet. And it's Thursday night and the disciples go to have dinner with Jesus in this, this, this house, this upper room, and it doesn't go how they think it's gonna go. Because instead of just sitting down and eating, Jesus begins to wash their feet, which makes them uncomfortable. And then after that, while they're eating, he tells them that one of them are going to betray him to the authorities, and ultimately he would be handed over and killed. Now think about how that would have made the disciples' entire world completely spin. Everything just came crashing down in a sentence at dinner. And and I can only imagine the rush of adrenaline they would have felt. You know when you get anxious or you get bad news, it's like a rush of heat comes over you, right? You can feel your heart racing, you're trying to control your breathing, your mind is spinning, your hands get clammy, right? Because they built their lives, their hopes, their future around Jesus, and he was just gonna leave? They left their jobs, their homes, their friends, their families, they can't go back. I can't imagine the fear and the sadness, and to make matters worse, you know they had to be terrified, because if the authorities were gonna come for Jesus, don't you think they were gonna come for them too? Talk about stress and anxiety, their lives were at risk. And it's crazy, you can see that the disciples are so shaken up that it doesn't really even register immediately. It's almost like they're in shock or denial, because they don't get it. They're asking questions. Um, They're like, where are you actually going? How how do we follow you? They think that Jesus is talking about a physical place like he's going to Chicago or something. And they don't get it. And so they start asking questions and Peter chimes in and he says, well, I'll follow you anywhere, Jesus. Only for Jesus to reply, Peter, by the end of the night, you're gonna deny me three times, man. And to add salt in the wound, this is Peter. The disciples look to him as a leader, and if he's gonna bail, what's gonna happen to the rest of us? But it's at that moment where Jesus interrupts the noise, the room quiets down, and he says these simple words in John 14, one through six. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Because in my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't even know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. And so Jesus starts to explain to them why he has to leave, right? Why he has to be handed over, why he has to be killed, and where he's actually going. And and again, the disciples are just not tracking at all, right? And Thomas eventually chimes in. He's like, Jesus, we don't have any idea where you're going. How in the world are we supposed to follow you there? How are you saying that we know the way? And that's when Jesus uttered words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And at first you might read this and go, how in the world is that comforting, right? That makes no sense. Like, Jesus, you're just talking in riddles. Like, how does that help anything right now? But if you look into what he's actually saying here, that the actual truth behind the statement and you think about it, it's actually the most comforting thing he could have possibly said in the moment. And so what we're gonna do for the next few minutes is we're gonna look at why that's comforting and what comfort that offers us today. And so first, much like Jason mentioned a few weeks ago in a a previous sermon in this series, by Jesus saying that I am the way, the truth, and the life, he is moving the, uh, the, the peace and the path forward for the disciples into a person himself, right? He told them, I know everything seems like it's falling apart right now. I know everything is crazy. Nothing looks like you thought it would. Don't focus on that. Set your eyes, focus on me. Trust in me. And think about what Jesus could have said to the disciples, right? Y'all have been with me for three years. I've literally spent the last three years teaching you everything you should know, and now you're worried? You'll figure this out on your own. You'll be fine. He could have given them a laundry list of do's and don'ts. He could have berated them for their lack of faith and their their lack of understanding, but he didn't. His response was simple. He said, I am the way. And what he was trying to do here is to get the disciples to take their trust off of their own understanding, off of their own ability, and place it on to who Jesus was, on to who he had proven himself to be, on to his ability to see the situation through. And it should have been easy for them, right? Because they had walked with Jesus as he calmed the storm, as he walked on water, as he healed the sick, the blind, the lame, as he raised the dude from the dead. If anybody knew the power Jesus had to handle a situation, it was them. Even if they didn't have all the answers, they were called to trust in who Jesus had proved to be the past three years. That's how Jesus comforted them. And that's how he comforts us today. He calls us to trust in his faithfulness, trust that he's reliable. And I know this idea kind of sounds churchy, right? Trusting in faithfulness, but it's not really a foreign concept, right? We we actually do this all the time if you think about it. In fact, I have a story. There was a buddy that I played football with in high school named Bronson. And he was a good athlete, right? He he was good at football. He was a little bit short, so he wasn't necessarily going D1 or anything, but, but he was good at football and he was confident and he always played well. And so there was a Friday night where we were scheduled to play one of basically the best teams in the state. And uh, we, were, we were all pretty nervous, right? I mean, we're talking multiple D1 athletes. We're talking like the TV crew was there. So if we got whipped, it was on TV and everybody was seeing it. And so we were a little bit nervous. And we're sitting in the locker room and I see that Bronson's just sitting there as confident as ever. I'm like, man, like, how are you not nervous right now? Like, what, what is your secret? Why are you never nervous in any situation? And he told me, he's like, man, it's my lucky gloves. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, yeah, it's the, these gloves. I've had them for six years and I've never played a bad game in them. And listen, if you know anything about football gloves or really any sports gloves at all, after like a month, these things start to smell like death. And so six years, it was terrible. It was terrible. Like you could bleach your hands and they're still smelling like stank afterwards. It was bad. And they were all taped up and everything. But he was being serious. I thought he was kidding, but he wasn't. And so we go out and we play, and did we win? Absolutely not. We got smoked on national television or local television. It felt like national television. Like we got beat so bad, I'm pretty sure they were subbing in a cheerleader at safety by the third quarter. (laughs) (laughs) But the whole game, Bronson's out there just playing his heart out, right? He's confident, he has a great game. And now, did those gloves actually help him at all? No, not at all. They were disgusting. 
But because he had a confidence that they weren't gonna let him down, he could move forward and he could handle the situation and he played well. And I know this sounds like a silly story, but we do stuff like this all the time, right? We trust in the faithfulness of all sorts of little things. Maybe it's a spot on the couch during the game. Maybe it's a routine before you go to your job. Maybe it's a certain way in how you do your job, but we place our trust in all of these pointless little things and they don't really do anything, but it comforts us. So think about how much more comfort we can have when we placed our trust in the faithfulness of the living Son of God. And this is exactly what scripture talks about time and time again. Hebrews 12 says, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And listen to this, this is crazy. Scorning its shame and set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And then this is the kicker. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. How could that kind of God ever let us down? And that's what Jesus wanted his disciples to trust in. That's how he comforted them. In the middle of their darkest hour, He wanted them to focus on who he was, on the fact that he was the way, that they didn't have to figure it out, they didn't have to blaze their own trail, that they could just rely upon him, rest and trust in his faithfulness, that he was going to see it through. And he offers you the same thing this morning. If you feel stressed, overwhelmed, inadequate to handle all the things that are going on in life, that's okay, we are. But Jesus isn't. And it's not up to you, it's up to him. And the sooner that we trust in that, the sooner we can seek the peace that he offers us. You can find peace by trusting in Jesus's faithfulness. But if you're like me, you hear that question or you hear what I just said and you're like, what in the world, right? How do I actually do that? Like that's such a churchy term, trust in Jesus's faithfulness. What does that practically look like in day-to-day life? And that's fair. Because I think the phrase just trust God gets thrown a lot, thrown around a lot in Christian circles, and, and we don't really explain it or flesh it out a whole lot. And so this morning, I want to give some of that explanation so that in the middle of all of our stress, all of our worry, all the fears of the world, we can take hold of that peace. And so if you track with me here, I would propose that one way that we trust in God's faithfulness is by walking in obedience to Him. And one way that we trust in God's faithfulness is that we walk in obedience to him. And I know this isn't like the just amazing, just confounding answer, it's simple, it's not real flashy, but it's the truth. And what I mean by it is think about it. How do you know when somebody trusts you? Or how do you know when you trust somebody? I would say one of the most clear indicators of how much you trust someone is how much you listen to what they tell you. If you trust someone, you listen to them and you heed your, their advice. And, and the time when I really, this clicked in my life, I was in college and I was in a program called Stonehouse. Um, and it was basically a men's discipleship program your freshman year. You lived on a hall with about 30 other guys and you would do weekly Bible studies, you would do weekly small groups, accountability. It was really just a formative experience to me. And you had your own mentor and your mentor would meet on a weekly basis and you would have, again, like I said, accountability, they would guide you. And I was in this program when I started dating my wife, Christine. And so uh, let's just say there was a reason why I was single going up to college. I had no clue what I was doing. Um, I did not have any sort of charm or any of that, right? I didn't know what I was doing. I learned to date from the public education system and spoiler alert, it's, it, they don't teach you very well there. And so I, when I started dating her and when I started being interested in her, I was asking Andrew for advice. I was like, man, what am I gonna do? Like, what, what, how do I make this work? I really like this girl, she loves Jesus. Uh, you know, I don't want to just torpedo this like I've done every relationship up to this point. <laughs> and he started giving me advice, but it was advice that I normally wouldn't have done, right? It's, it was stuff that in my, you know, college freshman mind sounded really lame. Right? I was like, well, you need to limit how much time you spend together, right? Don't stay up super late FaceTiming. Make sure that your lives aren't meshed more than what's appropriate for dating, right? Have a conversation. It's gonna be awkward, but talk about your boundaries. And, and all this stuff just seemed awkward. It seemed like anti-romantic, like it was cold and mechanical. And so one day I, I finally met with him. I was like, hey man, like I, I just don't know if this is good advice. Like I, I'll be honest, I really don't wanna do any of this. 
And Andrew, he, he stopped me and he listened to me. Thankfully, he didn't just like throw something in my face right there. But he said, Garrett, do you trust me? I was like, well, yeah, of course I trust you. This guy was godly, his Christian character had proved itself and he genuinely cared about me. And so I was like, yeah, yeah, I trust you. He's like, well, then listen to me. I was like, well, what do you mean by that? He's like, if you trust me, trust that the advice that I give you is not to ruin your relationship, but it's to help you. Because I've been through this, I've seen it. And I want you to succeed and I want you to do well. And so if you trust me, trust what I'm calling you to do and listen. And I did. And ultimately, he has, his, his advice made all the difference, right? right? The, the relationship worked out. We're married now, surprise. <laughs> and, and the whole point of that story is that my trust in Andrew was evident by how I listened to him. And to further this point, there's a guy named Joe Carter who has a quote, and he says this. He says, we don't come to know God through abstract speculation, but through living in the way the Lord requires. Specifically, we come to know God by understanding than doing what he commands. And he later goes on to compare it to how you can learn a lot about swimming from a book, but you don't really learn about swimming until you're in the water flailing around trying not to drown, right? We learn through experience, and this is the same way, like, right? but it's not just about this mental acknowledgement of trust. Right? We can sit here all day and I can say, yeah, well, I trust God. But what it is, is you have to actually do something with that mental acknowledgement. It's walking out in faith, right? It's taking a step of action that shows that that mental acknowledgement of trusting God is legit. And so, yes, trusting in God's faithfulness is looking at what he's done in your past, remembering everything he's done to get you to where you are now. But it's also trusting that if you continue to follow him, if you continue to walk in obedience, everything is gonna work out, right? This is the truth of Romans 8, 28, that we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. And so you have to trust that God's word is good for you, right? It might not make perfect sense in the moment. It might not be the super clear path forward, but trusting in his faithfulness is saying, all right, God, I don't have all the answers. I don't know how this is gonna turn up, but I'm gonna do what you say. I'm gonna go where you call me and I'm gonna trust that it's gonna work out. That is trusting in his faithfulness. Because if you trust in Jesus in, as the way, the truth, and the life, that means following him like he's the way, the truth, and the life. And so, I just want you to know that if you do that, if, if you genuinely trust in Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life, like if you will walk in obedience, you will find peace. I promise. Because if we trust in Jesus' faithfulness, if we walk in obedience to him, we can have this freedom that I can't explain to you, but you can't find anywhere else. And I'll, I'll do my best this morning. And, and what I mean by this is that when we face stress or worry, we usually have one of two responses, right? And most of you will probably identify with one or the other one of these. And so either you are completely paralyzed by stress, right? That means when you face a deadline, when you face something that worries you, something that's out of control, you don't wanna do anything. You procrastinate, you put things off, you try to distract yourself and just convince yourself that you're not stressed, everything's fine, everything's gonna be great, and you put it off and put it off and put it off. But the problem with that is eventually that's gonna come to a head, right? You can only put things off for so long. You can only run from that thing that's nagging and weighing on your heart for so long until it comes to roost. Or you're either paralyzed by stress or you respond to stress by striving to control everything in your life. You plan, you calendar, you organize, you do everything you can to create some superficial sense of control. And the problem with that, guys, if the last two years have taught us anything, you have so much less control than you'd like to think. Amen. It's all just false, it's all just fake, it's a mirage. Whatever our humanly coping mechanism is, it doesn't work. But listen, <laughs> when you place your hope your trust and your peace, when you trust that Jesus is the way, that he is faithful and you walk in obedience to him, it frees you from all of that. 
because you have the freedom to move forward. If you're paralyzed by stress, you're, you're freed up to realize, okay, something might go wrong. I might not succeed. I, I might fail. But guess what? Even if I do, I trust that God can use it in my life. Even if things don't go how I think they are, I know that there's a God in heaven who knit me together in my mother's womb and created the universe, and he will work things together for my good. He will set my path straight. And so I don't have to be afraid to put things off or try and distract myself. I can face those things head on and say, look, this is, this is crazy. I, I don't feel like I'm adequate, but guess what Jesus is? Or if you're like me and you try to just over-organize, over-plan, over-calendar and try to create this whole false sense of security, you can finally stop your striving. You can realize that that's all pointless vanity, right? We're really not in as much control as we would like to think. And it's not that you have to give up organization, but you can stop placing your trust in that. You can stop placing your trust in your own ability to have your life together. Because guess what? We're all really bad at getting our life together, if we're honest. And instead, you can rest in the fact that, hey, everything might seem out of control, everything might seem crazy, but I know that it's not for God. And that's what Jesus means. At the very, the very end of this statement, he says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. And what he means is that, and I wanna focus on that word life. What he means is that the only way not just eternally, but on this earth, that you can live and live life to its fullest and experience all that life has to offer is by following Jesus. And the most beautiful picture I have of this, the, the, most, the, the best, I was racking my brain to try and illustrate this, and the best thing I could possibly find is the story from a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Many people have probably heard of him, you may know his story. He was a pastor in Germany during World War II and he was very, a very vocal opponent of the Nazis, and Hitler specifically. And he began training pastors in an underground seminary as to provide some sort of help to the situation. Because he thought that if he could train up pastors who knew how to teach the word of God and knew how to shepherd people, that that could make an impact in the situation that was going on in Germany at that time. And ultimately, the Nazis would come and shut that down, and so he moved to serving as a double agent. Uh, he would work to free Jews. Uh, he would hide them. He would free them from Nazi oppression. He would also join the plot to overthrow Hitler. And so this guy he had just done so much to try and help the situation to where he could have easily just checked out, right? Because he eventually went to America, and while he was there, his friends and his colleagues really urged him, stay, dude, like you can't go back. It's gonna be a death sentence. And, and if anybody could have said, I've done my part, it could have been him, but he didn't. In fact, he was quoted as saying this, I must live through this difficult period of our national history with the Christian people of Germany. I will have no right to participate in the reconstruction of Christian life in Germany after the war if I do not share the trials of this time with my people. What peace, what type of state of mind do you have to have to go back to that situation? And all of the uncertainty, he didn't know what was gonna happen when he went there, but he went back. And ultimately when he went back, he was arrested. He spent two years in prison where he would continue to write and share the gospel with his fellow prisoners. And then unfortunately, in April of 1945, just months before the Allies would liberate this camp, he was moved to an extermination camp and he was executed by hanging. However, there was a captured pilot who recounted some of his last words and actually his last moments. And he said that at the place of execution, talking about Bonhoeffer, he again said a short prayer and then climbed the few steps to the gallows, brave and composed. In the almost 50 years that I worked as a doctor, I have hardly ever seen a man die so entirely submissive to the will of God. And then another fellow prisoner captured his last words in a sermon that Bonhoeffer preached the night before. He said, this is the end. For me, the beginning of life. Amen. Dietrich Bonhoeffer got it. He understood. Right, and it's not because he was some incredible man, it's not because he was just good enough by his own merit, but he understood that Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life. He took hold of the comfort that Jesus offered his disciples in that dimly lit room on a Thursday night before he'd be crucified. 
he understood. That is the just radical, crazy comfort and peace that we can have when we rest in the fact that Jesus is our way. He is our path forward. It's not up to us. We can trust that he is faithful. He is capable of figuring out things that are far beyond our understanding and that all we have to do is just follow him. If we follow him, everything will be okay. And so my question to you this morning, have you taken hold of that comfort? Have you taken hold of what Christ offers you. Because as we close, there's one detail in the story that I wanna go back and focus on. And and if I've lost you, uh, jump back in with me, because like, listen closely, track with me here if you don't mind, because this is probably the most striking and mind-blowing detail of this entire story. Think back to the scene earlier in the upper room. Right, Jesus just broke the news to the disciples and they're in a tailspin. Right, they are all losing it. And Jesus comforts them. Think about that, Jesus comforts these disciples. Do you realize how crazy that is? Here Jesus is comforting the disciples on the eve of his slaughter on a cross. Think about how we would respond to the disciples, right? What Jesus could have said. How dare you make this about you? I'm about to be hung on a cross for your sins. Meanwhile, none of you are gonna be there to support me and you're making this about you? Because think about the reality of the next 12 hours for Jesus. In an hour, a mere hour from when he said that I am statement, he would be in the Garden of Gethsemane so anxious about what was to come. He was literally sweating blood. And then an hour after that, he would be arrested, deserted by all of his closest friends who he was currently comforting, and he would be handed over to the authorities. Throughout the night, he would be beaten, he would be put through multiple sham trials. By daybreak, he would be flogged within an inch of his life. He would be forced to carry a rugged wooded cross on his raw back up a hill to be nailed to that cross and hung up naked to die a excruciating slow death all within the next 12 hours. But with full knowledge of the suffering that he was about to go through, he comforts and is genuinely concerned for his disciples. He calmly says, do not let your hearts be troubled. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's a love I can't imagine. I can't can't even think about the mindset, the, the, the love you have to have for somebody to on the eve of the worst 12 hours ever experienced by a human in human history, comfort those who are about to desert you. That is someone worth trusting. That is Jesus. That's who Jesus is. That's who he called them to trust and that was the character that we can take hope from. And it's the same Jesus who offers you that peace this morning in the middle of whatever you're going through. I know that as we enter a new year, that there's anxieties, there's stress, there's uncertainty about what's to come, about what this year will hold. Is this gonna be the the third part of a trilogy, 2020, 2021, 2022? And it's easy to just lie in bed at night and, and, and just not be able to get an ounce of sleep because you feel like it's all just spiraling out of control and you don't know what you're gonna do. I, I know I'm one of those people, I, I, I struggle with that, right? I, I mean, we're having a child this year, that's a little bit, or maybe for you it's a lifelong struggle with fear and worry. It's something that's chronic, you've dealt with it your whole life and you've just shoved it to the back pretending it's not there. Again, I'm right there with you. But let me tell you that this morning, let yourself be comforted by the fact that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You don't have to have it all figured out. You don't have to have it all under control. You never will. You don't have to just know every single thing that's gonna come forward, and and you don't have to be ready for it. You don't have to be strong enough to deal with it, because Jesus is. And he offers us himself. If we really take hold of that this morning, do you realize how much that changes everything? 
You don't have to drown in stress and worry and anxiety until the day you die, because that's just what happens here on earth. No, Jesus offers us life on this side of heaven. He offers us freedom on this side of heaven. And that's no promise that everything's just gonna work out fine. But it's the promise that even if it doesn't work out how we'd like, it's gonna be okay. It's the promise that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And as long as you follow him, it will all work out. And so we're about to have a time of response as the band comes up. And I think the song we're actually singing uh, at the end of this is The Way, The Truth, and The Life. And so what an opportunity to actually get to just cry out that truth. Cry it out to God. And maybe you think all of this sounds great. Maybe you're like, man, that, that sounds great, Garrett, but I don't know Jesus. You walked in here, you've never had a relationship with him. You've never placed your faith with him, faith in him as Lord. And Jesus actually says later in the statement that there is no way to the Father except through me. And so this morning, would you surrender to him? Let me tell you, there is no day like today to make that decision. It will change everything. That is a promise I can personally guarantee to you. You can finally rest. You can stop the striving. You can stop all of the things that you do to try and convince yourself everything's okay. And you can trust in Jesus and you can rest in that trust. Or maybe you've been a believer for years and years and years. But still, the, the enemy will whisper lies and you feel like you just get overwhelmed and you're drowning in the middle of everything that's going on, let me just encourage you, just come down this morning and pray. I'm gonna be down here at the front. We're gonna have people on the sides. Give that to God this morning. You can have a fresh start. We talked about new beginnings and fresh starts just a few minutes ago during worship. You can leave that at the altar this morning. Leave that at the feet of Jesus. Just come and pray with someone. Find comfort in that. That's the beauty of having this body of believers is that not only is Jesus the way and not only does he offer us peace, but he offers us a group of believers to seek that peace together with. And we're here to encourage each other, to love on each other. That's what we do. And that's the beauty of this church because I've seen it time and time again. So this morning, all I'm gonna ask you, I don't know how the Lord might be working in your heart. I don't know what he may be um, putting on your heart or, or urging you to do, but I do know that when we hear the word, God, the word of God being preached, we are called to respond. And so whatever that looks like to you, please respond. Just please be obedient. Take that first step, talking about walking out in obedience. Take that first step to trust in God's faithfulness and walk out in obedience this morning. Let's stand and respond.